Hey everyone, this is Caitlin Leopold. I am the registered dietitian at Anytime Fitness in Piqua. Um, and we're just kind of kind of continuing our kind of webinar topics. Um, and as you can see um, by this screen share, today's topic is fats. So in our previous months, we have talked about carbohydrates, we have talked about um, protein, um, and we're continuing that topic of macronutrients today on on fats. I was trying to get the glare uh, off of my off my picture on the side there, but um, so today, by the time we complete this webinar, I essentially want you to know what are the dietary fats that we consume, um, kind of what amount we should aim for, and ideally what functions that it does play on the body. So what exactly is fat? So as I mentioned, it is a macronutrient. So just as a reminder, a macronutrient is essentially the nutrients our body needs in abundance just to kind of function properly. So they kind of make up the big picture and kind of provide us with the nutrients um, that we need for just daily functioning. Um, and it does actually, fat provides nine calories per gram. So that is the most calorically dense macronutrient. So I usually always advocate this is calories and fat can add up pretty quick if we're not being cautious. So if you ever want to know um, what that means and how to calculate it. So if I were to have a food label um, and I see something provides five grams of fat, you literally just multiply that by nine and just know, you know, 45, 45 calories are from fat for that food item. So usually what I kind of say again is if I have, you know, 10 walnuts, that provides about 100 calories. There's a big difference in, you know, 10 walnuts versus, you know, two heaping handfuls. So again, just something to be cautious of moving forward. It is actually essential for us to eat some fats, but just like anything, we need to kind of know our proper amounts. So we just need to be cautious again on serving size and not to have um, an overabundance of that food item. It's all about kind of finding the right balance there. We do need to consume fats from our food. And specifically, there's two essential fatty acids that we must kind of get from food. Our body cannot make them, specifically linoleic acid, which is actually omega-6, um, and um, linolenic is omega-3 fatty acid. So we're going to go depth here in a little bit on a few upcoming slides, but those are the essential fatty acids that kind of make up our fats that we need to consume for food. Our body needs them for brain development, controlling inflammation, um, and even blood clotting. So they are important. So continuing that conversation, what does fat do for our body? Specifically, they do and it does aid in the absorption of our fat soluble vitamins. So our fat soluble vitamins specifically our vitamin A, which is important for healthy skin and eyes, vitamin D, which we all know is important for proper bone health, as well as helping us proper maintain proper amounts of our phosphorus and our calcium, vitamin E, which kind of helps with immunity a little bit and kind of preventing damage from free radicals um, in the body, and vitamin K, which is specifically is important for blood clotting. So fat is important in, in both, all of those because fat kind of helps aid in the transportation of those vitamins as well as the storage of those vitamins. We need to have adequate amounts of fat to be able to transport them throughout the body. Fat's also important for the protection and insulation of our organs, but I know here in the club in Piqua, where we have an in-body scale that kind of talks about visceral fat. So visceral, vis, visceral fat, excuse me, is the fat around our organs, right? And we know that if we have too much, it makes it more and more harder for that um, specific organ and on our hearts to work properly. It actually increases our risk for insulin resistance, heart disease, um, diabetes. So it's definitely important to make sure, right, we have proper um, amounts of fat there and not too much um, as well. Fat helps promote so cell growth as well as helping us maintain healthy skin and hair as well as produce certain hormones. 
the next one it can be used as a source of fuel so we're going to specifically actually talk about keto here in a following slide but our body can actually use fat as a source of fuel if we are not getting enough carbohydrate um, and it also helps us um, with blood sugar levels as well so i did talk a little bit about this when i talked about our carbohydrates but when i consume a carbohydrate right it's converted to glucose which is my energy um, but if I just consume a carbohydrate, right, it's going to spike my blood sugar and drop back down. So fat actually can help us stabilize our blood sugar levels as if I had a banana um, and a little bit of a peanut butter or a little a fat in a sense. It helps slow down that absorption and can kind of help us keep us full a little bit longer. So it can be, again, a sustained fuel energy source. Um, and the last one, fat does help us maintain proper body temperature. And again, that kind of helps with the protection um, and insulation of our organs as well. It does help regulate body temperature. So there are four different types of dietary fats that we will discuss today. Again, this is just kind of the summary and then we will dive deeper um, in these specific types here in the following slides. But there's four major types. They do include our saturated fats, specifically our trans fats, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. So there are essentially, right, four different types um, and they're kind of classified by their different physical property and structures. I'm not going to get into the specific, you know, scientific, scientific structure on these because I don't want to bore, bore all of you guys, but the way we can kind of classify them is essentially um, bad fats and healthy fats, if you've kind of always heard that term. Um, so the ones we want to limit are specifically our saturated fats and our trans fats. So a way to kind of know um, if they're more saturated or trans is that they do tend to be more solid at room temperature. For example, right, a stick of butter, which is a saturated fat, um, same thing actually, coconut oil is a saturated fat, right, and it's, it's a solid at room temperature. Um, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated are more often referred um, to a liquid or a liquid oil. So they're liquid at room temperature. So example, right, walnut oil, avocado oil, olive oil, right, those are those are liquids. So that's kind of a, an easier way to differentiate, differentiate, I cannot speak today, um, the two there. So again, to go in more depth, specifically the fats that we should likely limit in our diet are our saturated, and trans fats. So just a reminder, right, these are solid at room temperature. So too much of these types of fat can actually increase our overall cholesterol level, specifically, right, the total cholesterol, um, as well as the LDL, which is our bad cholesterol. So our saturated fats are typically found in animal products, okay, um, but there's also a few plants. Um, but as you can see, the sources are listed, but a lot of your whole fat dairy is technically a saturated fat. Technically, all of your meats are, um, do contain a little bit of saturated fat, but specifically the higher ones would be your sausage, bacon, beef, and your hamburgers. Um, pizza and cheese, for sure, are higher in saturated fat. Fried foods, fast foods um, contain a lot, some more of that saturated fat. The plant sources of our saturated fats specifically is our coconut, coconut oil, palm oil, and palm kernel oil. So I did want to talk a little bit about, about coconut oil because I think, I mean, it's starting to get a little less hype, but for a while there, um, I think coconut oil was like praised to be the answer to all the oils. And I'm here to kind of debunk that a little bit. Just know that coconut oil is actually a saturated fat, so we do not want to consume too much of it. Um, but reasons why I kind of got the hype is it contains something called medium chained fatty acids. So it's a little bit easier for our body to absorb than just our straight other saturated fats. Um, some studies have shown that it can help reducing heart disease um, as well as blood sugar control. But again, there's more and more studies showing that it, it can actually increase it as well. So there's really not enough information out there to say that, yes, it's the, a great kind of oil. Again, it can be used. Um, just make sure you're using it in moderation um, because it is, again, um, a saturated fat. And just too, too much saturated fat in general 
can affect our cholesterol levels. So again, just kind of be cautious um, and making sure we still aren't using a crazy amount of it, okay? And if you do have any more specific questions about coconut oil, um, please reach out to me and, and we can, we can kind of talk and, and figure something out, okay? Um, but next is our trans fat. So trans fat, our body literally views it as saturated fat. So again, it can raise our blood cholesterol levels. It comes from hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oils. So essentially it is a byproduct of a process called hydrogenization. It typically turns healthy oils um, into a solid and prevents prevents that food item essentially from going bad or going rancid, okay? So again, trans fat doesn't do anything good for our body. Our body views it as saturated fat. So typically, again, in your food labels and your ingredients, it's listed as hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oil. So the FDA actually kind of banned these partially hydrogenated and hydrogenated oils they are no longer recognized as safe in food items, believe it or not. So all food companies had until January 1st of 2020 to completely eliminate this from their food items. So if you find anything actually with any trans fat or that hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oils, it was probably produced before that January one. But most companies, um, from what I'm aware of and I've, what I've seen on food labels, is it's not in there anymore. So just something to kind of look out for. So kind of moral of the story of this slide is a diet rich in saturated fats can definitely drive up our total cholesterol and kind of um, tip the balance of our healthy cholesterol um, to our, our bad cholesterol. So it kind of increases our risk um, of blockages in the artery, thus in turn um, affecting our heart and increasing our risk even of stroke. So again, we just want to limit definitely our saturated fats. So with that, right, there are healthier option fats and specifically they are the ones that are unsaturated, okay? So unsaturated fats have been shown to improve our cholesterol levels, decrease inflammation, as well as stabilize heart rhythm. So they do separate into our monounsaturated and our polyunsaturated. And these actually break down a little bit further, um, which I'm gonna talk about in our next slide here. But our monounsaturated sources come from olive, pe peanut, canola oils, avocados, a lot of your nuts, um, specifically um, pumpkin and sesame seeds. And our polyunsaturated fats come from our sunflower, corn, soybean, flaxseed oils, walnuts, flax seeds, a lot of our fatty fishes, so salmon, tuna, um, and canola oil. And as you can see by canola oil, um, it is a little bit higher in monounsaturated fat, but it does, um, it is considered a good source of your polyunsaturated um, as well. So to continue with the fats that we want to aim for, again, um, they just break down to our omega-3s and our omega-6s. So our omega-3s, is an important type of a polyunsaturated fat. Um, there's essentially three types, but omega-3s are kind of an integral, important, I'll, I'll use that word, an um, important part of our cell membranes and throughout the body. So they kind of, they're used as receptors, so they kind of help get messages throughout our body, and they actually help produce certain hormones as well as regulate blood clotting. They're important for the contraction and relaxation of artery walls, and they specifically help fight inflammation um, in our body. So they even been helped to kind of prevent certain diseases such as heart disease, stroke. Um, they may help control um, a lot of inflammatory um, diseases in our body, specifically eczema, um, lupus, um, even arthritis. So it may help provide a little bit of protective role in those. So typically amount-wise, which I did list this on the bottom of the slide, an excellent way to get omega-3s is eating fatty fish, specifically again, salmon and tuna, two to three times a week. Um, there's many other sources of omega-3s. I would say they're listed up there. So our fatty fish is specifically salmon, tuna, um, and your ALAs, which I'm gonna pop back up first, and then I'll reiterate the sources. 
Um, but again, there's three types of omega-3s. I'm not, again, going to get into the specific science of these. I'm going to just use the abbreviations. But we got EPA and DHA. So these mainly come from your fish. So again, they're usually referred to marine omega-3s. And you got your ALA. Um, so this is the most common type of omega-3 fatty acid in your typical American diet. Um, again, it's typically found in a lot of your vegetable oils and your nuts. So when it comes to actually nuts, walnuts are the highest source of your omega-3s. So I usually advocate those. Our flax seeds and flaxseed oil, um, chia seeds are even a good source of omega-3s. Some of your dark leafy vegetables um, and some animal fats. So specifically, we talk about grass-fed animals which it actually has been shown that grass-fed beef does contain a little bit more omega-3s than your typical conventionally raised. Um, reason being it is what they're kind of fed um, during growth that they do contain a little bit more and it can actually help um, with inflammation as well. So again, our body cannot make them. We must consume them from food. So I typically, again, try to consume omega-3 at least two, three to times a week, if, especially if you're not um, consuming a supplement, but I typically, I always take the food first approach, but if again, you kind of find that you're consistently not getting omega-3s, um, a supplement may possibly be necessary. So again, if you do have any questions, please reach out. We do have um, dot fit here at the club, um, but there are some other brands um, as well, if you have any questions. Omega-6s, um, again, it's also an important fatty acid. Um, and it does come from most of your typical vegetable oil. So safflower oil, grapeseed, corn oils is kind of where you get a lot of your omega-6s. Pistachios are your omega-6 sources. Um, they do help lower LDL and boost your HDL. So our LDL is our bad cholesterol. Our HDL is healthy cholesterol. And they can help keep your blood sugar in check by improving your body's sensitivity to insulin, which is also important. So the sources are reiterated. So safflower, sunflower, corn, soybean, sunflower seeds, walnuts also contain a little bit of your omega-6s um, and pumpkin seeds as well. But the thing about omega-6s that I usually like to mention is we actually do want to consume more omega-3s than omega-6s. So the ratio is typically four to one. So for every four omega-3s that we have, you should consume one omega-6. When this is kind of reversed, um, believe it or not, it can actually cause inflammation in our body. Um, versus take it away. So I usually tell a lot of my clients for their main focus to kind of be your omega-3s and then maybe use, you know, one of these omega-6s in your cooking um, or snacks, but they shouldn't be, you know, your main goal to just get all your omega-6s. Um, focus on omega-3s um, most of the time is kind of a good, a good idea. So how much fat do we need? So if you've watched any of these previously, you know when it comes to specific amounts, um, it is kind of variable depending on the person um, and depending on your goals. But the 2015 to 2020 dietary guidelines do give some um, generalized recommendations. So total fat for your calories should be about 20 to 35% of your daily calories. The ones that, again, that we want to limit specifically is your saturated fat. So a good rule of thumb is to have no more than 10% of your daily calories come from saturated fat. So if you're looking for a gram amount specifically, men should not have more than about 30 grams um, and women should not have more than 20 grams. So just put that in perspective, right? If you're following a 2000 calorie diet, your target range should be um, 44 to 78 grams of fat. Um, and then again, breaks that down specifically for your saturated fat. Okay, so again, fat's not necessarily bad. Um, portion control is definitely key there. Um, if anyone has any issues, um, if heart disease runs in your family, if you do struggle with cholesterol, there is a more um, distinctive amount to aim for. Um, the American Heart Association actually has this a little bit less. It kind of goes further and says no more than 7% of your daily calories should come from saturated fat. And kind of the bulk of what you should aim for is those unsaturated fats. So again, those omega-3s, omega-6s that we just talked about um, in previous slides there. And again, too, if you want any help with a specific amount, if you're interested in counting macros and you're like, hey, I don't know how much fat I should have, um, again, just reach out to me um, and we can kind of go through that. But these next, I think it's four slides, um, if I'm wrong, um, I'm sorry, but I think it's about three to four 
Um, but these next slides, I, I use this as a resource with a lot of my clients. So I, I wanted to reach this out to you guys. This covers, as you can see, um, a lot of different types of oils. Um, their description is actually a lot of times what they taste like, um, kind of their cooking uses, as well as what type of fat it is, whether it's monosaturated, saturated, polyunsaturated, as well as the smoke point. So again, this is just a good reference to kind of use um, a lot of times and specifically why I advocate it is because of the smoke point. So if you've ever heard of a smoke point, it's actually the temperature at which it stops um, simmering and actually begins to smoke. So why is this necessarily important? Heating past its smoke point can actually break down the fats um, and actually start to produce free radicals. So to sum that up, it actually can cause a lot of those beneficial things that those fats provide um, to be destroyed by overheating. So a lot of those things that were once beneficial are actually no longer um, there in a sense. So we want to completely avoid using it past its smoke point. So that's why I like this guide because um, with that, that's kind of why it tells you cooking uses. Um, so a lot of those things with lower smoke points should be used for sauteing or used in dressings versus you know cooking um, for a, a drastic amount of time there. But on this page, I like to point out a few of them, but I'm not again, I'm not going to go through each single one. I kind of just put this in here um, for a reference guide for you guys. Um, but I do typically advocate avocado oil. Um, I typically actually use avocado oil more than I use olive oil, really. Um, and reason being is our smoke point is 520. So it can reach pretty high temps um, as well. And palette wise, it's pretty similar to olive oil. Like it literally doesn't really have much of a taste at least maybe um at least i know for me it doesn't uh, i compare it more to like olive oil taste wise so it's not really um that crazy um and the smoke point um is pretty high i mean ghee is on here i know a lot of people go towards um ghee just know too it is a saturated fat just like your butter because it is a clarified um kind of butter but it does include the smoke point on there and the same thing with coconut oil um, saturated fat, smoke point of 350. Um, and again, it just kind of goes through um, some of these. So again, this is just on here as a resource um, to you guys. Vegetable oil, um, it doesn't necessarily have a smoke point on there, but it is actually 400 to 450. Um, so that's there as well. All right. So of course, with the topic of fat, I definitely wanted to touch base on the keto diet, um, especially um, in today's society. Um, so I'm just kind of here to kind of reiterate what it is um, and maybe some of the risks that come with the keto diet, okay? And again, if you have any questions, please, please, please reach out. Um, but the keto diet on the classic ketogenic diet, you're consuming 70 to 80% of your daily calories from fat, about 20 to 25 from your protein, and just about a 5 to 10% from carbs. So there are variations in the keto diet. I know some people um, are a little bit more strict and some are a little bit more liberal, um, but in gist, that's about where it, where it is. So on that classic keto diet, with that five to 10% of your calories coming from carbs, that's only about 20 to 45 grams. And again, that depends on how kind of strict you are on there, um, but that's on an 1800 calorie diet. So to put that in perspective, if I eat one banana, that's about 30 grams. So we're not eating um, a lot of fruit, right? Typically when we're on a keto diet, we're completely eliminating our grains, most fruit um, and even right a lot of your dairy because you're also getting some some of your carbs from there so on a keto diet right we, we, we restrict carbs um, and we kind of force our body to run on fat for fuel versus that glucose for fuel okay so typically it actually takes about three to five days for essentially um, of carbohydrate restriction for our body to kind of fully burn through all of that glycogen storage and, you know, enter um, into ketosis, okay? So I wanted to talk a little bit um, about why we typically see some weight loss with that, all right? 
So typically, number one, when we are on a keto diet, we cut out a whole food group, right? So we cut out grains, we typically cut out fruits. So generally most of those that go on the keto diet, right, you're severely restricting your calories. So along with severely restricting your calories, right, you are tapping into our glycogen storage. So what happens, um, what, a, what glycogen is, right? It's our stored version of carbohydrates, right? So when I consume a carbohydrate, it's converted to glucose. And if I consume extra glucose, it's converted into glycogen, right? To give me energy when I'm not necessarily getting enough carbohydrates I need. So when we kind of convert um, into ketosis, right? Our body taps into these glycogen stores before it goes into ketosis. So for every glycogen store in our body, it holds about three to four grams of water. Okay, so naturally when we do this with this calorie restriction, right, we kind of drop weight pretty quickly because um, we're again tapping into our water storage. Um, so it may be a little bit motivating, right? We're seeing a lot of this weight loss, but a lot of time this initial weight loss um, is actually um, water because again, our body's tapping, tapping into these stores, okay? So, that's the main thing about the keto diet from my perspective um, with weight loss. And I'm not saying people haven't seen weight loss long term. I guess me as an RD, the biggest concern for our keto diet is you're severely restricting food groups, right? You're constricting fruits, you're constricting grains, okay? And typically most people that do the keto diet, when it's not monitored by a professional, specifically in RD, um, which should be the main one monitoring it, or a nurse. Um, um, I guess we're more concerned on what types of fats you're eating. Again, if you're aiming towards more of your healthy fats, your omega-3s, your omega-6s, where you're still getting some of those nutrients, that's okay. But I think the most typical American person goes towards our saturated fat sources, right? So again, a lot of your bacon, your butter, all of those things that over time, right, can increase our cholesterol levels and increase our risk for heart disease. So the thing about keto diet, um, believe it or not, it was actually created for those with epilepsy. So when they use fat as fuel, um, their seizures um, tend to be a little bit less. It wasn't created um, for weight loss. So there, studies wise, there isn't enough studies out there to show um, the long-term effects of keto. So again, short-term, we typically see a little bit of weight loss, but long-term we can't necessarily go back and aim for it. But one thing that's not sustainable long-term, right, that's one of the risks here, um, is we're cutting out a lot of beneficial vitamins and minerals. And a lot of times it's not a sustainable diet, right? Because if you give up bread um, and pastas, a lot of times, right, you wanna go back to those things, right? And you can kind of create that yo-yo effect, okay? So where do we get our carbohydrates? I guess I should name this too. Again, a lot of our fruits, a lot of our grains, and specifically your cow's milk um, and your, your yogurts, right? So if I completely eliminate that, that's actually where I get a bulk of my fiber, especially if keto is not done properly. You're not getting that fiber that you need to. So again, it can kind of affect your motility, um, your GI, um, your bowels, right? Things can not be moving properly and you start to lack a lot of beneficial vitamins and minerals. And of course, this isn't going to, your deficiency, if you do get deficient, it's not going to show up right away. It can even take years for this deficiency to kind of show up. So that's kind of my biggest concern with the keto diet. Um, I don't necessarily think it's the answer to weight loss, um, as in we need a lot of those beneficial vitamins and minerals. But I typically say if you choose to do the keto diet, one, please consult a professional to kind of help you consult um, and aim for at least some of your healthy fats, kind of still getting some of your fiber from your non-starchy carbohydrates, um, such as your, you know, um, lettuces and broccoli and those types of things where you get very little carbs versus your starchy ones. Um, and one, I typically recommend a multivitamin if you do choose to do the keto diet, because again, you're lacking a lot of those beneficial vitamins and minerals as well as a possible fiber supplement. Because again, we get a lot of our fiber from our whole grains and a lot of our vegetables as well. So those 
are kind of my biggest advice with the keto diet um, is just be aware of maybe some of the long-term effects. Um, and, and usually whenever, um, whenever anyone asks me that they're on a special diet specifically, usually my question is in general, um, why do you choose to do this? Um, and how long do you choose to do this? Um, right, so kind of question yourself um, with that as well. Um, and again, if you ever need a more in-depth help with nutrition, please, please reach out to someone that studied it um, and has researched it, right? Versus just hopping on something because um, your Aunt Sue does it in a sense, okay? Um, but that's my advice on there. Um, so you have your, your RD's take on it. And again, if you do have questions, please, please reach out. That's what I'm here for, okay? So in, in conclusion, again, fats are important for a healthy, well-balanced diet, um, and they're vital for many important functions in our body. Um, but just like anything, right, we need to make sure we're, we're consuming proper portions and proper amounts. When we do have fats, we want to ideally kind of replace a lot of those saturated fats with our unsaturated. So a lot of your, again, mega-3s and mega-6 sources. So eating good fats in place of those saturated fats can help prevent insulin resistance um, as well as lower our risk for heart disease. So again, our omega-3s, just to reiterate again, is a lot of our fatty fishes, so salmon, tuna, walnuts, flax seeds, chia seeds, um, sometimes even omega-3s fortified in certain things. So I know like Fair Life Milk, they now have one that's fortified with omega 3 Sometimes your eggs are fortified with omega 3 So ideally aim for omega-3s at least twice a week, um, if not three times, if not a little bit more, that's okay. Um, but we do want to make sure we're getting enough. Again, about 20 to 35% of your daily calories should be from a fat serving, okay? So I think I was like, that's about all I have for us today on the topic of fats. So if you do, again, have any questions, um, please, please reach out to me. I'm your resource. Again, my email is Caitlin at anytimepicwa.com. So I'm here. Our next webinar is food labels um, and added sugar. So we'll dive a little bit deeper into there um, and talk about um, what to look for, what, what, to, what to avoid uh, kind of thing, okay? So again, if you have questions, please reach out. And as always, thank you for watching.